you always find a way to just mention that play in game two. You just, <laughs> you always got to go there. And yes, sir, there she goes. Hello and welcome to episode 247 of section 138. I'm your host, Mark Colley, and we finally have the whole gang back together. We got Bryson, we got Jacob. Guys, how are you? Doing good, Mark. As of tomorrow on January 16th, that will mark officially one month until Pitchers and Catchers Report, which will be on February 16th. It just came out, or at least the workout dates came out a few days ago. It's confirmed. And, of course, we're here today uh, for a few different reasons. But, of course, the Blue Jays in particular over the last couple of days have been definitely a topic of conversation for certain reasons. And uh, a player in particular as well that we're going to be getting into today. And that should be a fun one. And excited here to be with you guys. And of course, Jacob, welcome back. It's the first time in a while that all three of us are here. So it's good that everyone's here for this one in, in particular today. Yeah, it's been a bit of a weird off season. I mean, we have some good news to talk about and some bad news to talk about, but it is what it is. I mean, this it's shaping up to be a good, I think, last month of hopefully the off season. And let's just hope everything is settled before the regular season. Cause the last thing we want to deal with is a whole bunch of, of just nonsense with when we should be focusing on this team, but I still think it's looking good. 2023 is, I mean, it's the first one I've been uh, here for since the, the new year started, but I think the team is still looking quite good despite some of the issues. Wow. Jacob coming in hot as always, uh, before we get to any of the stuff that we do have to talk about the Boba arbitration stuff, the rumors with Matt Chapman, extension maybe in the mix perhaps according to some shady accounts on twitter before we get to any of that jacob your thoughts on the brandon belt signing because we know we haven't got an opinion from you yet on that i th- i think it complicates things a little bit you know you now have a lot of players who can play in the infield but i i don't dislike it at all i think it it's one year realistically the risk associated with it is it's very minimal you now have somebody who if Springer, Guerrero, anybody needs a day off. You now have him, you have Merrifield. You have a lot of different guys that can be, I think, a lot more uh, uh, flexible in the positioning. So it, I don't think it's necessarily a bad move. I think maybe it's almost like a tiny bit better of a Steve Pierce deal, which by that by that means I don't think that was a bad trade or a bad signing at all. So very low risk. Rewards could be potentially high. I think it's overall a good deal. All right. That's what I like to hear. Um, okay, so the big topic for today is the Blue Jays and Bo Bichette. The uh, arbitration deadline was this past Friday. The Blue Jays settled with 11 out of their 12 players. The one they didn't settle with was Bo Bichette, and it is the largest spread between what a team filed and what a player filed in Major League Baseball. Bo Bichette wants $7.5 million from the Blue Jays. The Blue Jays are offering $5 million dollars. And normally something like this isn't huge news, but we haven't seen this for a bit for the Blue Jays. The last time that they had a player who um, went to arbitration with them was 2019 when it was Ryan DePera. And we have seen this kind of create some friction between the team and the player. You go back to Marcus Stroman in 2018 when there was controversy there. And that was a relatively small gap. I think it was about 400,000, but it proved to you know, provide some drama for the Blue Jays and of course the relationship with Marcus Stroman was um, I guess a little bit stressed from that point forward and so a lot of people are talking about what this means for the Blue Jays there's some context with previous filings with what Blue Jays have offered him before in pre-arb deals and so that I think combined with some fans just general distaste for Bichette plus some of his misplays in the past and what he's done especially defensively most recently in 2022, but going back to his major league debut, all this has combined to make this perhaps a little bit more controversial than it might seem like it is on the surface. So I guess just to start off your guys thoughts, um, what was your initial reaction when you saw this? Because I think for me, when I saw this first, I wasn't too shocked. Like I mentioned, you know, arbitration is something that all teams go through, all players go through. And sometimes there's going to be differences of in a, in opinion about what a player's value is. But I think, you know, the more you read into it and the more you kind of jog your memory as to what the context is in this situation, 
you can start to draw some lines in your head about what's going on with the Blue Jays. So I don't know. It'll be interesting to see what comes of this, but I'm curious what you guys think about this right off the bat. I think that if anybody needed to not go to arbitration, it's Bo Bichette. And And the unfortunate situation here is I advocate or I, 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 I like that he's advocating for himself and saying that, you know, I want this amount of money. I think I'm worth that. Fair enough. You can totally do that. And I don't think anybody would really disagree with, you know, wanting to do that. I mean, at the end of the day, this is your job that you are trying to make money in. Where it gets a little complicated is uh, if this is how it is, if you can barely just get a one year deal done with Boba Shedder, you can just barely negotiate things like that. I don't even want to know what the, the, extension or when he hits free agency what that's going to end up being like because i think what it could be is i want x years x million dollars blue jays are like no we're going to offer you this and then he ends up walking or he gets gets traded because the blue jays can't come to some type of agreement with them and i'm a little nervous i like i've seen a lot of people say that you know bobachette sucks he, he's garbage he's not doesn't deserve any of the money his defense is horrible Okay, yes, it's not very good as defense, but he is one of the best offensive players in the league, and he's been that for the last couple seasons. And I think that he's worth... It's tough. I think he's worth somewhere in the middle, like, uh, or and he'll be worth more once he signs some type of longer type of deal. But this just shows that I, I think that the, the two sides are not starting off on a good foot when it comes to contract negotiations. And we'll have to see. I think that this could... Be, I don't want to say be, be the beginning of the end, but I wouldn't be surprised if come a couple seasons from now, you see guys like Vladdy and Manoa and everybody get locked up. And then Bo is not really there because he, you know, they can't come to some type of agreement or maybe you talk about a, something like the Stroman situation where they they constantly have those disagreements. It's a player that's been up and down at times. And then he doesn't end up remaining with the team. Now that was a bit of a different story. Obviously the blue Jays were rebuilding at that time. And I think Bo Bichette is obviously a different position, but more valuable than Stroman was. I'm just a little nervous for what this means for the future. And you now have somebody that is, I don't think doesn't want to be here, but you have somebody who's clearly saying, this is what I want out of a contract out of, you know, whatever. And then the team is understandably not right there with him. But now we're seeing that, I think the two sides are a little bit further apart in terms of what they what they want out of each other. And what does that mean for the future? I don't know. Maybe this is the last season or two that we see with Bichette before he gets traded to God knows where or ends up leaving in free agency or something like that. But obviously, I would not want that to happen. I want him to stay on this team for as long as possible. I think, you know, you look at him and Guerrero, two of the cornerstones of really this Blue Jay team, but could be indicative of what is to come with if, if the two of them can't even agree on something like this now. And I'm interested to see what will happen with the actual arbitration. Like who's going to end up on the right side of this? Like, is it going to be Bichette getting it? And then the Blue Jays are realizing, okay, yeah, maybe we did lowball a little bit, or is it going to be the Blue Jays? And then Bo is furious about it for a couple of seasons until he can make more money. I'm not sure. I think as of right now, it's, it, it's a small ish issue, just given the fact that it, it is just an arbitration hearing. But what it means for the future could be a lot, and we'll we'll see what happens. I think, and as the years go on, Jacob, you do not sound good about this, like at all. Oh, I'm I nervous mean, for the future, one hundred percent. I mean, look, and honestly, I don't blame you in a, it to a certain factor. And there's, like you said, there's been a lot of people that have been concerned about this. I'll say this: when the news came out that he was the only one that didn't agree to, I guess, a deal before the arbitration deadline. I wasn't surprised either. And you look back to how this kind of all started. Let's let's rewind a little bit to last year. I think it was around March when basically their final year, uh, a lot of the guys, Bo Bichette, Alec Manoa, I think Vladimir Guerrero Jr. was also in his final year. All these guys are on their final year before they actually get to go to arbitration. So in the case that, or I guess they had one year before that, Basically, their contracts renew or the Jays offer a slight raise based off of, a, I believe it was a calculated like formula of how they did it. It was nothing personal. It was basically them crunching numbers based off of their stats. And then I guess the computer showed up to be a certain figure. And then Bo Bichette, along with Alec Manoa, were the only Jays who actually declined um what the uh, what they were offering so then they were stuck making the same salary that they did in 2021 and i guess the idea of turning that down is eventually at some point in the future whenever you do get paid you're going to make up for that so when Bobachet initially declined this he basically came out 
and said he disagreed with the formula. He believes he's worth more. And you have to imagine that there is a similar reasoning to why there was no agreement made as well in this case, in terms of he disagrees with the formula, number one, and number two, that he believes he's worth more. And maybe he just doesn't believe he's getting that respect from the front office. That's really the only thing that you can assume right now to be the reason why he declined uh, or avoiding arbitration, because I think the, that's the last thing that anybody wants to do is go to arbitration. Mark, you were mentioning the, I guess, in the uh, Blue Jays history, the last time they went to arbitration, and then one of the most famous cases where arbitration turned out to be a really negative thing. The only thing or the only part of that Marcus Stroman um, example that I feel a little bit better about with Bo Bichette is Bo Bichette's character and ego is nowhere close to what Marcus Stroman's was on the team. I know you're just pr pretty much giving the example. So I, I, I know that's what all you were saying on that one, but that's the only part of the arbitration thing where I don't get as nervous about it. But at the same time too, we know the risks that come along with this. I mean, arbitration in the past, I believe it feels like over the years from what we've learned, it's gotten better, but there was definitely a point too, where it was strictly something that that could easily be something that was rough. And now when you look at it, perhaps an arbitration approach, of course, we have no idea how it truly goes. But the thing that I would assume is if you're like, if you're from the Blue Jay standpoint, is that you're just looking at previous uh, players around the same caliber who have been already been through the process and have already gotten certain um, amounts of money in the past. I mean, there was a chart that came out a couple of days ago, and I'm sure you guys have seen it basically of past shortstop around Bo Bichette's caliber, or even, even a little bit better than Bo Bichette's caliber, who have already been through arbitration. And it's basically a list of Francisco Lindor, Carlos Correa, Corey Seager, Trey Turner, have your bias, and the list goes on. And most of those guys were making around that $5 million mark, besides for Francisco Lindor, who made around $10.5 million. So when you look at the previous filings and you look at the history of it, you can understand or at least I understand where the Jays are coming from in terms of what they're offering. And of course, Bo Bichette obviously disagrees and he is somebody that is seeking seven and a half million dollars. And Mark, you mentioned the biggest gap that they've had or the biggest gap, of course, going into an arbitration hearing. It's going to be very interesting to see how that plays out because of the fact that it's a big gap or the big gap. Of course, a simple person will come out and say, meet in the middle and then you can move forward to the season. But clearly either side right now is willing to budge and that's the other part where I get a little nervous about. And of course, you go into the season now, you go into spring training, or and then you go into the season. We don't know how pissed off Bo Bichette can get from this. We have no idea. I mean, there's something that he might be able to shake it off and play baseball. But then at the back of his head, you really don't know what he's truly thinking. And of course, that's a, a really big risk when you take in sports, not for the short term, but of course, for the long term, for when the time comes where arbitration's not going to cut it anymore. And these guys need contracts. The other part that makes this very confusing for my end is in comparison with a guy like Vladimir Guerrero Jr., we really don't know how the Jays are really foreseeing this because of the fact that Vladimir Guerrero Jr. is another guy who agreed to avoid arbitration, of course, a couple days ago for $14.5 million. But at the same time, he doesn't get that contract extension that we were all anticipating that possibly this winter could be the case. I know I came out and predicted that that was going to happen this winter. It doesn't look like it now. Of course, there's always a chance that they can negotiate something even before spring training starts. But this has been a very, you know, over the last couple of years, it's starting to gain steam and it's only going to gain steam as we get closer to when they are free agents, you unrestricted free agents is what is truly their end game here in terms of what they plan to do with Vladimir Guerrero Jr., what they plan to do with Bo Bichette, because for, for, I guess for both guys in these cases, these are both guys, that, again, another offseason where they don't get a contract extension. We see the comparisons all around baseball with players getting their franchise deals, getting paid at such a young age. I think the latest guy to do it uh, last year, from what I remember, was Julio Rodriguez. But of course, he's one of many other stars who have already been paid. So that's the other part where this gets us very confused, because we truly don't know what I guess the result is going to be on this point. Cause it's been a very quiet manner of how the Jays have handled this. Like we haven't heard any sort of leaks, any rumors. The only thing that we've heard of is that Vladimir Guerrero jr. Would like to, or is really open and probably would get a deal done. If that, if the terms came to that, and I believe he said something along the lines of a quote like that near the end of the season. So I worry a little bit about the long term. I also want to take a, a note here because a lot of people have turned on Boba Shep. Mark, you mentioned it off the top. I want to say as well, 
I think the Bo Bichette slander has gotten a little bit out of hand, of course. I just, I think there's a lot of hate going to him right now. And I just, I don't think it's the greatest thing to do right now to, I guess, you know, I don't think they're underappreciating Bo Bichette or maybe they are in a way, some fans. I just, the fact that the slander has just gained steam over the last couple of days, it just, to me, I don't like it that much. I mean, we all know how big of a part Bo Bichette is. Of course, he was a big part in that playoff run, of course, at the end of the season when he gained steam. It's just the backlash that he has received over the past couple of days is pretty substantial. So it's just a storyline before spring training starts now where we have to kind of figure out how this is going to end. And the other question is going to be how does Bo Bichette or how is Bo Bichette going to feel after this is all done, of course, that's something that we're gonna have to keep an eye on now as we enter this season. Yeah, I gotta be honest, I don't think the Bobachette slander really surprises me because he's always been this sort of, whether rightfully or not, divisive figure on Blue Jays social media. And the fact that, you know, when there is a little bit of friction between him and the team, when there is a bit of controversy, the fact that a lot of fans are kind of expressing that doesn't surprise me. And there's always been a lot of fans who are unhappy with his defense or with his up and down offense. And the fact that it's coming out now doesn't surprise me. Um, I mean, part of me is tempted to say that it's justified. And I don't mean that in the sense that all of it is justified because there's a lot of this slander going around. That's pretty extreme, right? That he doesn't care about the blue Jays that they want him traded right now, that he's not worth any money, that he's a terrible shortstop. Like there's, a lot of that going around and none of that is justified, but the, I guess the sense of frustration with him, I think has been boiling for a while. And there are in my mind, some legitimate reasons behind it. That's not to say Bo Bichette's a bad player. That's not to say the blue Jays should trade him. That's not to say he doesn't have a place and value to this team, but I think there are reasons why fans are disappointed in him. Like he came up the same time as Vladdy um, and hasn't really lived up to the same amount of hype as Vladdy. And I think that's partly because he was never supposed to be as good a player, but a lot of people see his defense as very frustrating. A lot of people see his up and down offense as very frustrating. And I know we hear seems like daily on the broadcast, how much he's the hardest working guy in the clubhouse. And he's out there, the first guy on the field, taking grounders and, um, you know, all these things, but it doesn't seem like it's paid off and that his defense has improved. So I think that's where the sense of frustration is coming from. And I think, to be honest, if you're playing devil's advocate, you can see it as justified. Now, the question of whether this is just going to be, you know, water under the bridge or whether this boils into something bigger, I think goes back to what you were saying, Brayson. I don't think it will turn into anything bigger. And I think that's because of, Bo Bichette's personality because of who he is and you know using the comparison of Marcus Stroman is a little bit unjustified because Marcus Stroman we know and we've seen in the years since 2018 is a big character and a big ego and Bryson I see you moving your hands right now he talks a lot and he talks about the Blue Jays even when he's not on the Blue Jays as we saw with his tweet from a couple of years ago that quote-unquote this management will never build around their young talent and they will always fail. Um, you know, Bobochet isn't that guy. Like Bobochet's a lot more measured than that. He's a lot more reasonable. And besides these two instances, you know, last year kind of rejecting the contract that the Blue Jays offered. And then this year, um, obviously going to arbitration. Now, besides those two instances, I'm not sure we really have many more instances of Bobochet disagreeing with the team. Although Bryson, it seems like there is something happening now. So at the beginning of the offseason, I noticed it. And um, I don't know exactly when it happened, but it's something that still, as I check right now, that isn't there. And that is Bo uh Instagram was deactivated. And again, I don't know how long ago it was. I know it was at some point, obviously, before all this came down. But this was something that was probably done, I think, it had to be right after the season, or it might have been even at the final parts of the season. So I guess, I mean, in terms of personality, like you said, there's no, there's no platform for him to go out and do what you were saying in terms of Marcus Stroman examples. But of course, I don't think we were ever expecting that even if it was still there, but I yeah. guess that also just proves that the social media, it's something that he's no longer, I guess, active in right now either. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously very different people. So I think the comparison of Marcus Stroman is, 
bit misleading and we shouldn't expect the same thing to happen this time as it did with both as it did with uh marcus stroman although i do think the you know deactivating instagram thing is interesting i don't think we should read too much into it because i mean like if it happened towards the end of the season if it happened after that final game of the season obviously there was a lot going on there and uh you know taking a step back from social media for mental health or otherwise i think is completely justified for a player to do so i don't want to read into that but yeah he doesn't have the same platform he doesn't have the same personality as marcus stroman and totally different scenarios so i think while our minds may jump there it's not a perfect comparison and there are other historical comparisons that might be better for boba bobachette so you look at like previous very big arbitration differences like andrew jones and tim raines are two of the ones that have been brought up by uh, cam lewis of Blue Jays Nation and both of those very large differences ended up not matter mattering all that much. Tim Raines went on to play for the Expos for quite a long time after that and Andrew Jones never had many issues with his team. So, you know, we have historical examples of this happening and not posing much of an issue. So, like I think there's a potential for controversy and I think more than anything, regardless of the relationship between the Blue Jays and Bo Bichette, I think what this tarnishes is a relationship between Bo Bichette and some fans. Like, I don't think this is doing him any favors in winning over fans who are already skeptical of him or already frustrated with his defense or, you know, any of that sort of thing. Um, Bryson, you brought up the the possibility of extensions. I know we're going to talk about Chapman later in this episode because there's been some rumblings there, but specifically with Bo Bichette and Vladdy, I'm interested in what you two guys think about this. But for me, it seems like the ship has kind of sailed. And I say this because around baseball, we see extensions happening very early in careers. Like you mentioned Julio Rodriguez. He was extended very early in his career. And you look at the example of the Atlanta Braves. They've been doing this nonstop, extending players very early in their careers. We're talking first year in the majors, second year in the majors, maybe even third year in the majors, but certainly not into the arbitration years. And the fact that the Blue Jays have waited this long and have yet to extend Vladdy and have yet to extend Bo makes me think that the ship may have sailed, that we may have lost our opportunity to lock these guys up long term, or at least lock them up before they hit free agency when the cost is going to be a lot higher. So I'm interested in hearing from both of you. Do you think the ship has sailed? What is your confidence level? What do you think the odds are that the Blue Jays sign either of these guys to long-term extensions, especially with what we've just talked about with Bo Bichette. So when it comes to Bo, I have absolutely no idea. I wouldn't be surprised if he stays, but I wouldn't say that the ship has sailed with Vladimir Guerrero Jr. at all. And here's the thing. The Blue Jays, this current management that they have, Shapiro and Atkins, have not signed anybody to really anything more than what, like a six-year deal, the Springer deal, uh, well, there was, I guess the the biggest comparison would be Jose Barrios, the seven years. Yeah, okay, that's fair enough. I almost forgot about that one. So, yeah, but they, they haven't gotten up to that whole eight to 13 or whatever year deal. So I, I, I don't know. Part of me thinks that's just not what they want to do. And as much as it would be nice to have Vladimir Guerrero Jr. here until we're all well into our adult life and some fans, you know, like basically like we'd love for them to be here for a long time but that being said i just i don't think that that's what the blue jays necessarily do i could be totally wrong we could hear in the next month that one of them or both of them are signed i doubt both of them after what just happened but you know what i mean like i i wouldn't be surprised if either of them most likely guerrero signs some type of extension but just because it hasn't happened yet i don't think that it means it's not going to happen yeah, I mean, and it, it's it's just so difficult because Jacob, you were touching on it. Like they don't, it's very they don't have they haven't done this often. And like like you guys were saying, the Jose Barrios one was probably obviously the most recent one, and it's one of the biggest ones they've done. But I guess I'll allude to what I said earlier, and that was I remember I guess I, when we were previewing the off season, you kind of gave a wish list of what to expect this off season. And there, there might have even been a conversation about this at some point in the summer, even before. Bo Bichette went on, went on his tear at the plate in August and September. And I remember saying that I would hold off uh, on a Bo Bichette extension, even back during that point in the summer. Uh, and the Vladimir Guerrero Jr. one, though, I've, I've always felt like that's something that they sooner rather than later should get done. 
like you were saying now, like this is his first arbitration year. So technically he has, I guess, or altogether, he's got three years of arbitration before he hits free agency. And this was year one uh, out of year three. So he's a free agent in 2026. And I believe that's a, pretty much the exact same timeline as Bo Bichette. And, you know, I, I don't know if the ship has necessarily sailed. It's something that, but in comparison and what in retrospect to what you've been saying to other young talent across the league, it's definitely a different, situation now because like we were talking about it, julio rodriguez have hadn't even had a full year of service time um in an in the mlb and then he gets that extension and i can't even explain it to you without anybody getting confused it's like a 14 year deal or something and it's got like sort of different opt-outs it's very confusing we know fernando tatis jr despite his off the field antics uh he was well compensated way before as well ronald acuna of course everybody is familiar with all these names but you look at vladimir guerrero jr along that caliber of young talent along that wave of prospects that came in and are uh, came in around the league at the same time and he's still without a contract so technically there was always a chance that it could obviously happen this offseason I don't necessarily feel good about that now I'd love to be wrong and I hope I'm wrong and then after this year you get two more cracks at it before he might even turn anything down and say at this point I want to test the free agent market, and I hope that's the last thing that happens. I think that this is too much of a risk to take in terms of letting Vladimir Guerrero Jr. go out into the market like this, which is why I'm still holding out hope at some point they can get an extension done, and I really hope that, or I really also think it's in the best interest for them to do that. You just know the hype around it, the generational talent with Vladimir Guerrero Jr., of course, not the greatest 2022 season, but of course, high expectations as well out of him this upcoming season, I think. I'll, all across the board and it's going to be interesting to see how he you know fixes his game or plays better than what he did last year and it wasn't even a bad season from him. it was just a little bit of a down season compared to what we saw in 2021 but the Boba Shet one to me that's the complex one as much as the Vladimir Guerrero Jr. one hasn't happened as well I just for some reason or I just believe at some point it is eventually going to get done and I'm hopeful that I or that is the case but with Boba Shet, I remember saying it in the summer and I still have said it now and even you know, I just I don't necessarily know how interested they even are right now in one either. I mean, Mark, you you shared the tweet today in terms of what Scott Boris mentioned about Xander Bogarts and the Jays trying hard for that. That's interesting in terms of going after a shortstop like that. That's a couple straight seasons now. The Jays have pursued somebody at shortstop, and you wonder if that's moving or planning beyond Bo Bichette, if that is maybe – planning to eventually move him to second base you we have no idea what that means because obviously it didn't happen but the fact that they're keeping these conversations open and they're keeping these ideas open to go after different shortstops to go after you know and these are shortstops that are big names that could potentially take over the position or again replace him in some sort of we we just don't know again what the end game is here which is obviously the cloudy part in all this because we can't see or we have no idea how this is truly going to end, but a Boba Shed extension, I felt poor about in the summer in terms of even committing. And now, even if they did want to commit, how pissed off is he again? What's the ripple effect of this arbitration case? And then when you look beyond those guys, there's other guys and other candidates, of course, that are going to be due up. And that's a guy like Matt Chapman, who you've touched on. I also look at a guy like Alec Manoa. How is that going to work out? He's probably, I think he's a year or two behind in terms of, the current timeline with Boba and Vladimir Guerrero Jr., where he still has a couple more years before he is arbitration eligible. But that's another guy you got to think of about how they're eventually going to address that one, because that's another issue that is going to be or eventually get on their plate as well. And you hope by the time Alec Manoa is, I guess, the center point, you would hope that a guy like Vladimir Guerrero Jr. is already taken care of in terms of a contract extension. But the Boba Shet one's interesting. The end part of it, it's too complicated for me to predict. But I do not think there's an extension there right now at all, as I thought in the summer. But for Vladimir Guerrero Jr., I'm hopeful one day it can get done. Yeah, I think I'm there with you. I don't really see a Bo Bichette extension happening right now, especially, or not even right now, but just in the long run as well. I don't see it happening at all, and especially because of what you mentioned, like the interest that the Blue Jays have shown in other shortstops, especially that rumor we saw with Xander Bogarts, which is really, really interesting. And just to you know, flesh it out a bit more, Scott Boris said today when he was talking about Xander Bogarts' eventual deal with the Padres, mentioned some of the teams that were pushing hard for Bogarts. And among the list was Minnesota, 
the Cubs were also in there and then the Blue Jays were in there as well. So, you know, the fact that they're pushing hard for a shortstop in free agency makes me think that they aren't really committed to Bobichet long term, especially when someone like Xander Bogarts is going to be commanding a 10 year plus deal like you're committing long term to someone like that. And the Blue Jays don't seem to have that same level of commitment with Bobichet. So I think I'm right there with you. Um while we are on the conversation of extensions, we do want to talk about one of the extensions that has been, I don't want to use the word rumored because it's not really rumors. They're rumblings. They're like ish, rumor ish. I, I don't know what the word to use here would be. Like basically the root of this is that it was Jeff Blair on Sports Night, right? Who said, Chapman and his wife really like Toronto and could be persuaded to stay is kind of what the rumors sounded like. So again, we're talking really, really rough here. We really have no clue whether this is true or not. And Jeff Blair, I mean, love him as an analyst, but he does say some things that seem to never pan out. So, you know, we will take this with a big grain of salt, but it's the off season. We're in January. We're a month away from pitchers and catchers reporting. We're going to talk about it anyways. Matt Chapman extension, I think all of us would be enthused about. We love what he brought to the Blue Jays, or at least I love what he brought to the Blue Jays in 2022. I think, um, you know, he was kind of the first indication we had that the Blue Jays were really, really stressing run prevention, to use that magic word. And um, obviously, we've seen that philosophy pan out in a couple different ways this offseason. But the addition of Matt Chapman, both for, you know, primarily his defense and the additions he um, brought there on the left side of the infield, but then also his offense, what he had in his bat and the hot streaks he went on and some of those home run streaks he had over the course of the season. Um, I don't think anyone's complaining about him on this team. And then I think the last factor, uh, you know, kind of the third important factor is just his presence on this team. He seems like someone who very quickly became a leader in the clubhouse, was respected instantly the moment he stepped foot in Dunedin in spring training last season. And so seeing him stay with this team long-term would be incredible. I'd love to see it. I am all for it. As far as what a deal looks like, I guess I'll leave that to you guys to discuss because I don't know what a deal would look like at this point in his career, but I am all for the Blue Jays signing Matt Chapman long-term, especially since it doesn't really seem like they have anyone queuing up at third base. I know they got a lot of infielders in the system coming up, but I don't think anyone is, you know, going to push Chapman out of a job. They don't have anyone that's vying for the role directly right now. That's the thing. I mean, if you lose him, who do you have? Like you've traded a lot of your infield prospects to the point where you now you need somebody if he's not here after next season. And I th I mean, when I think about it, his defense, like you mentioned, obviously that is unparalleled. One of the best defenders uh, best third baseman in the league, one of the best defenders, I think, even just in general. But his offense, too, like you talk about that. Yeah, he is streaky at times, but 27 home runs last season. It's pretty good, like especially when you did lose Teoscar Hernandez. I know Gurriel didn't have a lot of home runs this season, but you're now losing two outfielders who could hit you home runs or at least hit uh, quite a bit. And I know they did get Dalton Varsho, so that kind of buffers it a little bit, but you need that offense. And even a couple seasons ago when they had Simeon, they lose him. You now, like you've consistently had guys who can hit a lot of home runs for you, who, who can be everyday players on your, on your roster. And then you keep losing them. If you lose Matt Chapman, that's another player that you're going to need to go out and replace. And if you want to win the AL East, you want to win the American league or even the world series. I think Matt Chapman is somebody that has to be on that roster. If, if you want to be one of the best teams in the league, he makes you one of the best teams in the league. Now, when it comes to what I would offer him, that's where it gets a little bit more complicated because obviously he is 29. He's not, I mean, he's, I guess you can call him in his prime right now, maybe towards the early middle-ish of his prime. If you get him for X amount of seasons, some type of long-term extension, you'll get him for his prime and then the end of it. I don't know what he, I don't know what his minimum is, I think is what's hard to say. Like if you're talking ideal world, five-ish maybe years, four, five, six, something within that range. But maybe he wants more. Maybe he wants to finish his career with a guaranteed salary. I mean, if you make 
100 million over that many years or years or 125 whatever you're pretty much set but still that's that's what i mean it, where it gets a little tough is i don't know what matt chapman wants i've made it clear i think if if you're the blue jays four to six seasons you get him with some type of extension so four to six say they sign him for five years that would be this season 2023 and then five more seasons i wouldn't be surprised uh, I wouldn't be surprised if that's what uh, the Blue Jays would want, but is that what Matt Chapman wants or is what they're offering him in terms of a pay? Is that not the same as what he wants? I think that's all obviously things like that are what negotiations are for. How many years you want, how much money do you want? But I'm worried that I think a deal would get done, but if there was something stopping it, I'd be worried that it's more of the Blue Jays not wanting to help Chapman maybe finish his career here or something like that. But I I I wouldn't be surprised if they do end up extending him within the next well they, if they don't extend him by the end of next season then they don't have him but I wouldn't be surprised if they do do something and keep him beyond uh, this season. Yeah, I mean in comparison to Boba Shett, you just you have good when you think of Matt Chapman, when you think about the fit, like there's no there's not really any bad vibes or bad feelings about this. Like we know what he brings. We know how impactful he was last year, of course, in his only season here. Maybe at the beginning of the season, it kind of took him a little bit to get going in terms of being settled and being comfortable with the team. But I think at some point around the summer, like he really it's it seemed like especially at the plate, he really found his stride through certain moments and he had a really or a couple different hot stretches. But the one thing that always remained consistent was that he was always great defensively. And obviously that was the primary trait to why he was brought in here. Um, he just seems like he's all class. He seems like he was a good fit in the clubhouse. Everything about the Matt Chapman fit in Toronto, and I think what he likes as well, or how he liked it after one year, based on what you were saying, Mark, depending on how accurate it truly is. But I mean, even if you say it, you it doesn't, you know, it doesn't really kind of make you scratch your head a bit. It kind of, you know, you feel like it would make sense, and you feel like he would. Everything that was said could be true in terms of liking it here open to an extension perhaps it's something that the jays are heavily pursuing and all of that just screams good vibes on that jacob you're asking i guess other than matt chapman who you really had and basically right now entering 2023 nobody that is potentially major league ready whatsoever i mean of course there's Relvis martinez who we're all very familiar with there's addison berger who was also just added to the the roster i believe it was on november 15th and i think there's spencer horowitz but these are all guys again who are young and who exactly aren't major league ready? I mean, our Elvis Martinez is obviously getting closer, but in terms of who else is there, those are right now your options internally. So clearly, I mean, if you, I guess, get let go of Matt Chapman or if he's not there, it's potentially a little bit of a, you know, it's not exactly a perfect situation uh, as it stands right now, but I don't think that's going to be the case. I do think that Matt Chapman, is going to stay. I think that this is something that the front office is going to focus on. And it just, again, it's something that it just feels like it, it's a perfect fit in terms of how it makes sense, how the first year went, you know, he's entering year two now in terms of being with the same team, you know, some might say he's going to be even more comfortable right off the start compared to what he was at last year. Again, it took him a few weeks or months to get going. And uh, when you look at a situation though, Jacob, you're mentioning uh, age 29. And of course this is his first time, as well, who is going to be, I, if he doesn't sign an extension, it's going to be the first time where he also enters unrestricted free agency. This is a guy here who has had, I think it's five years of service time, which means he has a couple years left or one more year left of arbitration. But of course, from a friendly reminder at the beginning of the season, he signed that two-year extension uh, for $25 million to avoid arbitration, to avoid those last two years of arbitration and to go right into free agency. He's represented by, of course, the famous Scott Boris, and then, I mean, this is somebody, though, of course, despite the mutual interest that there may be to stay, he's def he's definitely going to be seeking a very lengthy contract or at least a decent contract where, of course, he would get the similar thing on the open market. Of course, again, being represented by Scott Boris, you're not really messing around here unless you're Carlos Correa with physicals and signing with three different teams in a span of a month. I mean, with Matt Chapman, it just seems very straightforward in terms of the mutual interest, why it makes sense. There really isn't many red flags, in my opinion, in terms of why you wouldn't do this. And if he's really open to it, this is something that you got to pursue, especially during camp. I think this is something that could potentially come out even throughout that right before the regular season. Don't know about 
any sort of in-season negotiations. It's very rare you see that in terms of any sort of long-term extensions, but of course it's happened before, but it's just a perfect fit. And unlike Bo Bichette, this seems to be a simple relationship, a simple solution, and a simple pathway to keeping them around long-term. It's just, you look at the two and it's really fascinating to see how, one, you feel really good about the chances of staying, and the other, not so much in terms of, I guess, problems and just tension and unknown of how this is going to play out long term. So it's nice that with Matt Chapman, it's nice and simple. Yeah. And I mean, you mentioned the two year, $25 million extension that he signed last year, very shortly after he came over to the Blue Jays. And I think that's part of this that also plays into this. Like we have an indication of what his relationship is like with the front office and given that they already came to terms on one deal albeit you know a short one that just bought out his arbitration years I think that indicates to me that he is even more willing to have conversations with the Blue Jays to negotiate with the Blue Jays and maybe get something done there so I think all signs point to this being plausible for it being possible how close we actually are to it whether it will ever actually happen is another question entirely you know sometimes the things that make the most sense never happen for whatever reason so we'll see whether that's the case um i know we are all looking forward to hopefully one day him being a blue jay for quite a long time um okay anything either of you want to mention before we wrap up uh, i think that's actually you know what maybe there's one thing i know people don't like boba Shet right now but please stop harassing him on social media and stop bashing him because he is still a good player. I know we have our issues with him, but if you want to try and convince somebody to play and or to stay in your organization, the last thing you do is you bash him for six months because of a play that happened or because of anything. Like that's just my two cents. I have my issues with him, but I'm not going to go and harass the crap out of him on social media. You always find a way to just mention that play in game two. You just <laughs> You always got to go there, and it's just it it's was really eight tough. One. Yeah, like it, it was really tough. It's <laughs> forget it. It's it, no, like, like you but, said but, though. Like yes, but go I back agree. to what I said. I don't. Have, yeah, of course. I, I don't. I don't blame him for that play completely. Okay, we're not talking about that. Play. Yes. Okay. We're fine. Let's about... move on. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, you are right in terms of what you said beforehand. I just, as much as Marky made very good points, of course, earlier on about the whole criticism, of course. He's a very important part of this team uh, as long as he's going to be here. And we know how special he can be. Of course, the defense is something that will always, or it seems to be a, an ongoing challenge. I don't know how much they anticipated it would be going on this far, but that's been the case. Clean that up, have a really good 2023. And uh, I mean, that's like the, I guess the perfect situation, the perfect scenario for this team who are going to try and be better than last year. So we'll see what happens with that, but it's going to be, an interesting storyline heading into spring training in terms of how this whole arbitration hearing plays out. And I think it's something that we're all going to be keeping our eyes on about this one. We're definitely too harsh on him sometimes. And, you know, looking at the stats, he has the sixth most war out of MLB shortstop since the start of 2020 and the fifth highest WRC plus according to fan graph. So like the numbers are there for some reason, we, I say we collectively as a fan base have a, obsession with criticizing him more than a lot of other players I think but he is a good player bottom line whether he lives up to expectations or not and of course never cross that line of harassing someone on social media and uh, you know maybe the one thing he needs to persuade him to stay with the Blue Jays long term is a deep run in the playoffs in 2023 and with that we'll wrap up today's episode as always you can support us by going to our social media at section 138 pod that's on instagram twitter and tiktok you can rate and review our podcast on itunes on apple podcasts and on spotify or wherever you get your podcast just help spread the word about what we're doing we'll catch you next time we record hopefully within a week either way pitchers and catchers reporting coming up in a month we'll catch you next time <laughs>